Hello to everyone joining us online and here in the room for today's hybrid event, the European Health Union. Not wishful thinking, but a reflection of Europeans' real concerns. Today's event is organized by the European Institute of Health and Sustainable Development and the Foundation of European Progressive Studies. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels, coming at you live from the heart of the EU quarter, and I'm going to be guiding us through today's discussion. Now, we know many things about our world have changed since the pandemic. Of course, we're meeting here in this hybrid fashion with some of the audience here in the room and some of you out there joining us virtually. And we know that we've really only been able to start doing this again recently after two years of the pandemic, which has changed so much about our daily lives, also how we work, and also a lot in terms of policy. Here in Brussels, we know that much about EU policy has changed during the pandemic. Things that we thought weren't possible before, now suddenly are. One obvious example is the EU's massive recovery fund, but another is new thinking about the way that the EU handles health care. Throughout this pandemic, we've been reminded that health is defined as a member state competence under the EU treaties. Healthcare systems differ widely within the EU. Statistics show there is a wide gap between the health systems of different EU member states. Healthcare expenditures per capita differ considerably. And yet, the EU has always been more involved in healthcare than the treaties might suggest. For one thing, the EU focuses on health outcomes and can coordinate member state policies in various areas so countries can learn from each other's best practices. But we saw that during the pandemic, just this coordination role wasn't the whole element. For the first time, the Commission started going for further than it ever had before. For instance, in bulk purchasing vaccines for the EU, it endeavored to coordinate the European response to the pandemic in general, and the Commission even created a Europe-wide health app, the Vaccine certi Certification Scheme, which enabled all the different national apps across the EU to communicate with each other. So all of this has increased talk about whether the EU should become more involved in health and whether we need a European health union. Now, this is an idea that's been around for a while, but it's really gotten trax traction recently, mostly because of the pandemic. But I think uh, we'll hear from our panelists today that it's not only the pandemic. Uh, th that's not the only reason that people are talking about this more. This has been a trend over several years, even before the pandemic hit. So today we're going to be talking about what such a European health union would look like and whether we need it. Does current European health policy correspond to the expectations of European citizens? Are there proposals on the table that can increase this type of European healthcare coordination? And how do we actually make this happen? Do we need treaty change or can we do this outside the confines of treaty change, which as we know, is a very difficult exercise. Now, you guys at home and also you all here in the audience will be able to ask your questions to the panelists using Slido. If you're watching online, you should see a spot just to the right of where I'm talking where you can type in your questions and I can read them out to the panelists. Uh, and you guys in the audience, you'll be able to log on to Slido using the code 0357395. You all have slips uh, with QR codes on your seats that you can log in to use that. So let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to now introduce you here in the studio to Vitenis Andriokaitis. He is the former European Commissioner for Health and Food Safety. Vitenis, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to start out uh, with a couple questions for you because this is really an area you've been working on for some time. And as I mentioned in the introductory remarks, health is, we know, a really important area for Europeans' daily lives. Um, but traditionally, it's not been a topic that the EU has been in the center of, at least in terms of the treaties, which has really limited how the EU could get involved. So why do you think that this narrative of the European Health Union has really started to take hold recently? Is it just because of the pandemic, or is it for other reasons? Okay, <clears throat> my answer is yes and no. 
Yes, because of pandemic and now because of pandemic. Why? Because speaking about situation, you can look at people's general concerns and general support speaking about health. I delivered maybe more than 56 citizens' dialogues in my capacity being as Commissioner for Health and Food Safety in all 27 member states. Believe me, all um, uh, you know, uh, audience also ask me about why you are so weak in delivery, for example, vaccines, or to, to help us to, to have uh, cheapest medicine, to help us to, uh, to have easier access to health care, to primary health care. What about? And you know, those questions were always, always on, on, on the table. And of course, you know very well that at political level, attention to health is always when some crisis is shocking to you. You remember, uh, it was BCH uh, crisis, then it was, uh, you know, uh, 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 dioxin crisis, and Europe then acts reactively, establishing some agencies. First of all, EFSA, then EMA, ECDC, you know, but that reacting, but not going into deepest understanding why health is not on top of European Union policy. And now you see it's the same. You see that we have a lot of questions on the table, speaking about health care and cure, speaking about uh, better coordination, uh, uh, thinking about public health issues, avoiding, you know, a uh, big number of excessive deaths or premature deaths in Europe, in one hand, and in the other hand, you know, all are asking, no, 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 sorry, it is member states' responsibility. We are always acting to, to supporting, to you know, coordinating and supplementing. If member states will ask commission to do something, but if they have no appetite to ask, forget it. And you know, now, now health is like a princess, not like a Cinderella. Because <laughs> you know, always now uh, all political leaders, especially one year ago, they uh, decided to dance with with such princes. But I can mention that first first time in history when President of the European Commission uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen told, "Yes, for me it's crystal clear. We need to build the strongest European health union." It was okay before European Parliament make make very strong message about necessity. And then then you see. In, in time of, of opening of conference on the future of Europe, uh, presidents of uh, 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 France propose: yes, we need to, to speak about uh, you know uh, health more clearly, and of course also president of the European Parliament ma made a statement that yes, it would be good to think also about in improvements and amendments of Lisbon Treaty. And if you remember, after Angela Merkel followed the same statement, yes, maybe it's time to discuss. Okay, it means that something was happened in those, in those you know, uh, two years. And I would like to tell you, public support is now is very high. Please look, Eurobarometer, in, 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 uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, published in, in uh, October 2021, uh, which... Uh, two of the following uh, uh, would you consider to be most helpful for the future of Europe? First, comparable living standards. Second, a common health policy. And third, stronger solidarity among the EU member states. Crystal clear support. Let's do something more and together. There is often this impression, I think, from the public that people in Brussels always just want to Europeanize every issue. But you have experience not just at the European level, but at the national level. Uh, you worked in the national parliament and as a minister of health for Lithuania. So when it comes to the national perspective, what are the arguments for stronger European health policy from the national perspective? How can this really benefit national government? From the national perspective, no one government can solve problems with patients with rare disease. No one, especially in smallest countries. Believe me. You have no capacities, you have no, no, no knowledge, no clinical experience, because you have only thousands of thousands of, of people suffering with rare disease. Also, uh, treatment is very uh, expensive. B why? Because of, you have no single market in, uh, in, in pharmaceuticals. 
And reimbursement list, reimbursement list are very different one. And if some innovative medicine was registered by EMA and was then placed in Germany, for example, you can see that it can, can, can come to smallest country in period seven, nine years. And the feeling is that you have two sorts of citizens, second-hand and first-hand citizens, and it is your national obligation to deliver treatment, but you have no chance. Second issue is unmet needs, waiting list, cross-border cooperation, and healthcare workers shortages. You have regions where you have fewer doctors and fewer nurses. Why? Because social dumping. And now going out into more richest countries, you see no chance to find pan-European solution. Is it needed? You now you have in one in all countries abundant regions. Speaking from national perspective, you have no chance to to deliver it. Or rare cancers, for example. How can you deliver uh, from national point of view? You need to, to combine pan-European efforts and to build pan-European ecosystem. Otherwise, it was always blaming and shaming game. From and ministers are always under attacks about uh, prices, about you know delivery of, of, of treatments, about lack of nurses, about you know uh, you know regional disparities, waiting lists, for example. We need to think also about how can we reduce time of waiting list and also uh, out of pocket payments. So I mean, you were living under these constraints when you were a health commissioner here in Brussels. How much did that experience shape? you're thinking about health union now. Yes. Was it frustrating at the time? Yes, absolutely. First of all, I was shocked uh, with some of my experiences because my understanding was that if I will be commissioner responsible for public health and food, I will be much more stronger because I have I am a medical doctor. I have experience working in, in at national parliament level, in government, of course being member of European Convention. Well, let's do. But it was very you know, shocked this situation when I saw that treaty limits do not allow you to do much more. It's strange. Can I give you one example? You know, we can much easier to vaccinate cows because we have at European level vaccine bank. But we have no chance to support countries in need vaccinating children. It was the measles outbreak in Romania. And we have no chance to have some, you know, some, some bank to support, to react immediately. Of course, we started with public procurement, <laughs> but it was voluntary. From the beginning, we collected 14 countries, then 18, then at the end of my mandate, 26. But it was really a very slow process. And also, if you look at possibility to, to strengthen European reference networks, once again, you have no chance to have some budgetary line to, support, to guarantee stabil, stable financial flow to such reference network. And you have no chance to, 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 to deliver in a very fast way the needs of people to be treated. It was really a challenging issue. Yeah, I can imagine it's the type of situation where you're given this very big portfolio because health is so important, and then the EU is kind of putting constraints on it. But you know, with the disproportion between health portfolio in my capacity and food portfolio, enormous. Yeah. In food safety, we have brilliant instruments. You know, we have infrastructure, we have EFSA, we have, on, in all countries, we have, you know, uh, uh, teams with whom we are cooperating. And food safety standards are so important from public health point also. And food safety uh, brings big uh, added value globally. In public health, <laughs> sorry, absolutely asymmetric. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast between the two parts of the portfolio. Let's bring in some of our other panelists here for this first panel uh, to talk more about this, this issue. Uh, so here in the studio, here live with us as well, we have uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez, president of the European Foundation of Progressive Studies. And also joining us remotely is another former European commissioner, Mario Monti, president of Boccioni University and former prime minister of Italy. And we also also have Joseph Figueras, director of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. So we've just heard a little bit from Vitennis about his experience working as a, a health commissioner here in Brussels. And 
and really where we find ourselves right now. Mario Monti, let me put uh, a question to you. Do you think that we need a European health union, coming both from your time here in Brussels, but also uh, coming from the national perspective? Is this really needed? Yes, it is needed. Uh, listening to Commissioner Andrew Kaitis, uh, I was reminded of uh, the famous uh, sentence of Jean Monnet, one of the fathers of Europe, who said, uh, Europe will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions adopted for these crises. Now, crises uh, come uh, during the life of the European Union, and they, their manifestation is that there is a, a triggering moment in which member states, national ministers, realize that they can no longer achieve their objectives. So after a suffering process, they come to admit that it's better to share some portion of their sovereignty in a given area with other member states, rather than sticking to the phantom of a sovereignty which is no longer there in reality. We saw this very eloquently uh, in, uh, in a previous uh, European Union, the European Monetary Union, when in the 70s and the 80s there were so many foreign exchange crises and even the most uh, powerful uh, ministers, the ministers of, of uh, finance and, uh, and the central bank governors decided in the end that it was more worthwhile to share a currency and uh, monetary policy making uh, with the others rather than with the exception of Germany losing it completely to the marketplace. So the euro and the ECB were born. Now the pandemic worked as a similar trigger in the area of uh, public health, hence the need for the European Health Union. And it was interesting that uh, as a response of the European Union to the pandemic crisis, we saw that uh, uh, there was uh, a, a dual track. In the areas where there were already in the treaty and in the practice elements to respond, so the economic and financial and monetary uh, instruments to cope with the crisis, to respond to the economic and financial consequences of the pandemic, the EU was rather quick, rather effective. Not that much in the area of public health, for the reasons that uh, you, our moderator, and Commissioner Andrew Kaitis uh, explained so well. That is why I believe that this is a triggering moment in the Monet categorization. This is the moment when a European health union may well uh, shift from being a dream of European funds to a reality, not easy to achieve, but something that uh, will be uh, concretely very much looked for. Thanks, Professor Monti. As you say, so many of these European integration moments have been driven by these triggering moments in response to a problem, response to a crisis. Maria, what do you think that, uh, what do citizens really want? I mean, when we're looking at the, the outcome here, the outcome in the pandemic, the outcome up till now in terms of European health policy, are citizens happy with how healthcare policy is working in the EU? Does it correspond to their expectations? Well, I would say that even before the pandemics, they were still not uh, satisfied. But with the pandemics, which was a dramatic experience for all of us, I think that citizens now, they want more from Europe regarding health. First of all, uh, when dealing with uh, something like COVID, they want to have stronger coordination we start improving coordination, that's for sure, but we'd like to improve coordination with a common set of rules, easy to understand, but also able to adapt to the different waves of the pandemics. So it's um, 
to make something which is complex should be made simple by stronger European coordination. Then I believe that they also want stronger European capacity to identify the pandemic's uh, threat, to come up with solutions, updated vaccines, uh, updated medicines, and this means uh, updated industrial policy, innovation policy, and research policy. We also have a problem of capacity re regarding human resources. We need more human resources in the health uh, sector. Uh, but as uh, Kamish uh, Viten is, uh, was uh, saying, um, there is something also which is a big inequality of European citizens regarding access to all this. So I believe that uh, cities also want convergence. Uh, they want to have the same set of basic conditions uh, to have access to a better uh, health care. And I would say, if we now look to the global picture, and we see that many other countries in the world are still lagging behind the levels of protection we have reached in Europe, I believe that uh, most of citizens also want more international solidarity because they understood that we don't, if we don't have a general global solution, finally we cannot really master the uh, response to the pandemics. And of course we have a long way to go for that convergence. And here I'll bring in Joseph Figueres. Uh, we know that health systems in Europe differ greatly. Um, how much do they differ? How much do health outcomes and health systems, health policies, differ between member states of the European Union? Health outcomes, they differ a lot. Actually, they, this is one of the questions I heard more times in my life. Whenever I'm in a conference and say there's convergence, half of the audience gets up and says, no, there's divergence, we are different. Whenever I say there's divergence in the conference, half of the audience gets up and says, no, there's convergence. So it's quite an interesting question. Uh, Overall, I will argue very strongly that uh, the, the challenges, the main strategic objectives are exactly the same. When you go to member states and as observers, you have the opportunity to work with them. They're talking about integrated care. They're talking about continuity of care, how you bring social and health care together. You talk about the strength in primary health care. You talk about, particularly now after the, the pandemic, or with the pandemic still, the, 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 the health workforce. The, the retaining the health workforce, incentivizing the health workforce. We're talking about HTA and accessing uh, innovation, how we evaluate new innovation and how we access innovation, determinants. I could go on and on in the list. So at the broader level, when you talk to member states, the priorities and directions are the same. Of course, systems are different. And all of us working in this field, we know these concepts of path dependency. We know what context. We know what different actors and different systems that may implement, will implement those in different ways. But ultimately, the main priorities are very much the same. And this is where, if I may, adding and, and, and echoing the comments of my uh, great uh, co-panelists today, and Vitenis, of course, uh, in those, there is an enormous amount of value added in working together. If I may, I like to talk about this concept of, of, of subsidiarity and which is a very political concept, and this point that Mari was saying about sharing sovereignty. It seems to me the debate on, on subsidiarity is purely political and, and okay. But technocratically, the pandemic, but beyond the pandemic, has taught us there are many areas where not under the principle of subsidiarity and need a broader European action. So you were saying that, Dave, at the beginning, the natural laboratory, to learning from each other, to learning how different countries have put in place different strategies. Actually, there's a, a major digital research project now in place to look at transformation and learning from each other. Uh, but also look at, from the economic perspective, externalities. The virus is a cross-border externality, but there are many others. The economic crisis was externality. The refugee crisis was externality. They have to be dealt at the broader level. The economies of scope and scale, look at what uh, Vitenius was saying, that are the rare diseases. These are areas of high technology that we are much better off, or training for high technology, working together, or the idea of European common public goods. 
IT, digital, human resources, I will argue uh, later, are areas that are public goods because there's transfer, there is cross-border of technology, of professionals, and so on. So there are a number of areas that are no longer technocratically, technically, under the principle of subsidiarity and are very much common priorities. Digital is the one that everyone agrees, of course, but there are many others that actually are common public goods, are externalities, and there is a clear technocratic cost-effective rationale to deal together. Let alone, of course, as my colleagues have said today, the issue of values. There is such a thing as European values that our citizens are sharing. So, Vitenis, you were part of the, the publication for a, of a manifesto for an EHU in 2020. What is the main thing that the initiative is looking to accomplish? And how do those goals differ from the way the European Commission, the current European Commission, envisages a European health union? Okay, let me first of all welcome European uh, Commission initiative because this first step is, of course, the, uh, uh, like uh, uh, President of the Commission mentioned, it is the first building block. Yes, for sure. But it is, I, I fully uh, uh, understand the limits of European Commission. The European Commission has no chance to move forward. They proposed uh, um, common uh, procurement agreement, yes, uh, by, uh, they propose to establish immediately here, uh, uh, you know, um, a health emergency response agency, like in previous crisis, and they propose pharmaceutical strategy, and also Europe is beating cancer plan, that's all. Because, but they have no chance to overcome limits, because European Union works on, on you know, on uh, enumerated powers. Enumerated powers are coming from whom? From whom? From member states. From member states, from national parliaments, from governments. And the European Commission has no chance to move forward. Our manifesto is, is asked very clearly. Let's think about possibilities to, to strengthen capacities, capacities at a local level, at national level, at European Parliament level, at European Council level, at European Commission level, because we see rationale to introduce solidarity-based concrete mechanisms, not to, you know, keeping powers in Brussels. It's a big mistake. It's not our message. Our message in our manifesto is very clear. If we can in, in, strengthen a little bit shared competences, we can develop better cooperation between member states' governments. You know how many times ministers of, of health gathering in Europe? Ministers of Agriculture getting 12 times per, per year. Ministers of Finance, 12 times. Ministers of, 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 of uh, Health, two times per year. Because it's a, you have no separate um, health council. And please look, now we are speaking about animal health, plant health, soil health, water and air conditions, yes. Uh, human health, and we just are, are capable to develop one health approach combining social pillar, combining SDGs, and combining climate change. But where is health in the treaty? Zero. In the treaty, health is as an ancillary issue, not as an aim. But the European Union was built on the idea to save lives and to avoid wars. And health can keep us the strongest if we are saving lives. Our manifesto is, pro is in the way to propose better cooperation, st more strongest shared responsibilities, and possibly develop some uh, in technical instruments to help us, uh, you know, to help people with rare disease. 30 million people are suffering in the EU with rare disease. Please keep in mind their relatives. It's about 100 more people. They need social care, they need a lot. Where is Europe? Can we do much more? Our manifesto is, is proposing possibilities to establish a health and well-being union. You know, because all unions are enshrined in treaty. Customs union, monetary and fiscal union, digital union. What? Please keep in mind defense and security union. All those issues are in the treaty, except health and well-being union. Health is in the treaty Cinderella. 
It's, it's not, not a way. And public general support is so high, so strong. Please send message to our voters in the next European Parliament. Please vote in favor for those who are capable to, 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 to build strongest European health unions because we need it. You please abandon regions. People are uh, very worried about, about their health. And they are voting for, uh, for Eurosceptics because they do not see solution from European Union side. If we ca be capable uh, to deliver, you know, health, it especially universal health coverage, uh, primary health care, and, and, and nursing, and, and long-term care, it is, uh, it is impossible without strengthening of, of treaties and without providing real workable instruments. We need to have comitology on our board. We need to have to see health ministers gathering minimum six times per year in Brussels, discussing, you know, shared competence. And shared competence do what? They invite governments to act more proactively. Let's talk about the lessons learned from the pandemic. Mario Monti, I'll put this question to you. This, this uh, question that Vitenis just referenced there where people were asking, where is Europe? This is something we heard a lot during the pandemic, but of course, a lot of ink was spilled about the conundrum that the commission was in. People were demanding action on a pandemic, but the, they weren't willing to give the commission the power to act. Is there a risk that the first impulse from national governments is to blame Brussels uh, for not coordinating correctly while also not giving Brussels the full power it needs? Well, um, it would be particularly lamentable if this happened in the case of health, but as we all know by experience, this game tends to happen uh, most of the time in most uh, policy areas. Now, health comes uh, uh, late to the arsenal of EU instruments, but is uh, too serious a topic uh, to be the object of these uh, narrow-minded uh, uh, tactical games between uh, of, of the member states. That is uh, why uh, I believe the pressure for the EU to deliver and therefore the corresponding pressure of the EU to ask that it should be given the powers necessary to deliver will be uh, strong. And uh, what uh, I would like to uh, underline, other colleagues on the panel did this already, but I would like to underline that at any rate, the Commission was uh, active in the field of health uh, over the last couple of years, um, also in uh, particular aspects, very important though, of health policy where treaty powers were not uh, necessary. For example, um, as uh, proposed uh, by the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, of which uh, I had the honor to be the chair and which received a huge contribution among others, uh, from uh, um, uh, Joseph Figueras, uh, and then also from Professor Martin McKee, we, who will appear later. Well, uh, that commission made a number of proposals also on how to develop the global governance of health. And uh, many of them are in different uh, stages of being worked out. One has been adopted in principle and is being implemented, that is the idea of having at the G20 a uh, health and finance board or a health and finance task force to have a much closer cooperation between health ministers and finance ministers uh, all the time, not only when a huge uh, uh, global health uh, uh, crisis uh, uh, erupts. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, idea has received a very strong uh, push uh, from the European Commission, because in particular, uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen uh, sponsored very early on this idea in the Global Health Summit, which uh, was held uh, uh, in May 2021 uh, in Rome under the joint uh, chair of the 
uh, European Commission and uh, the uh, chair of the G20 for last year, Mario Draghi, the Prime Minister of Italy. So the Commission is certainly determined to do a lot, uh, even where uh, there are topics concerning health not strictly related to treaty powers. On that subject of what's possible without treaty powers, we've had a question come in from the audience. Uh, Maria, I'll put it to you. So this question is from Thibaut Derwell. My question relates to how we get to the EHU. What's the best strategy to get to a treaty change? Does the issue need to be politicized, or can we win on more rational arguments such as necessity? What do you think is treaty change necessary, and then do we have to tackle that as a political objective? Look, I was part of the team negotiating the Lisbon Treaty, so uh, I know there are limits of the Lisbon Treaty regarding health. I think Vitenis is right, because the European Union competences about health are the lowest level, meaning only supporting competences. And I believe that for crucial objectives of health policy, we should move up to shared competences between the European Union and member states. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, yes, we need a target change of the treaty about this uh, to ensure that we have more precise coordination mm -hmm. uh, and to ensure that uh, these uh, coordination and conversions are supported by a stronger European budgetary capacity. We have created exceptional um, recovery fund, but somehow this recovery fund should be extended over time to provide a financial basis for uh, European action on health. Mm -hmm. But I believe there is a more fundamental problem regarding the objectives of the European Union. Because look, our European Union is not only a market, is no longer only a single market, it is a union. And so this means that when we define the objectives of the Union, we should say that, yes, we want to build a common market, but we also all, uh, to make all member states, and all citizens, having access to sustainable development goals, including the social, environmental dimension, and the health objective. The health objective should be there explicitly. Mm? So what is at stake is... Uh, in fact, is to recognize once and for all that our European Union is much more than a market. It's a, a common entity where we democratically define that we want to go to better standards. Mm -hmm. And she, this should be brought to the um, current Conference on the Future of Europe, where this topic of health is included. And uh, we need to uh, enlarge the debate because I'm sure that citizens will support this uh, uh, development of uh, political objectives. Well, another question on this topic comes from Philippe Domanski. Uh, so, Joseph, I'll put this to you. Philippe asks, what are the low-hanging fruits that the policymakers should reach first in order to progress with the European Health Union? Thank you, and thank you to Philippe. Very nice to hear from him. Uh, I, I, I think uh, exactly this. I mean, I would be for, uh, in favor of the treaty reform as well, but the question is perfect, the low-hanging fruits. There is a lot of instruments that exist. We did a whole policy brief, we'll, we'll change the chat for, with and the leadership of the Slovenian presidency, looking at the range of instruments that are available at the moment, and more so after the pandemic, the Recovery Resilience Fund is there, but the new strength in Europe for Health is another one. The Digital Health, Digital Health Europe is another one. The new digital reform, uh, which is not new, supporting member states. So we have a number of instruments available that we're not using effectively. The initiative that you were mentioned earlier that Vitenis is leading together with our colleagues of the Gastein Forum on the European Health Union, what we're doing is looking at how to use these existing instruments. Take joint purchasing. Joint purchasing that we learned through the vaccine has an enormous potential to access new innovation together with, the, with other member states. Take the, another instrument, which is the one 
of the of the rare diseases of of the of the of of, uh, of the hospitals working together in this area how do we apply these instruments to other areas how do we plan these instruments for training how do we plan the current instruments to join planning of health workforce so there are many very good point very low hanging fruit that can also demonstrate which is one of the points that if you are uh, uh, highlighting today a very good one to the European citizens, the actual value, if you have a patient, have a family with a problem, can be treated elsewhere, or we have support from elsewhere. The cross-border directive, how do we take that one implement it fully so the patients can see, the European citizens, the patients can see the benefits. So there are plenty of those health technology assessment. Many member states would love to have shared technology assessment and supporting each other as to not only the authorization of new medicines but at least having some sense of whether to include it on the package of care and so on so there are many many low-hanging fruits that would show to our policymakers, to our citizens the value of working together and many of those let me repeat that something that the, the monte commission if i may uh, mario is really the monte commission put beautifully there the idea of global public goods the idea of european public goods where the criteria of subsidiarity no longer counts and we need to work together. There's very strong rationale beyond the politics for that going beyond the current European Health Union, which is very much in the right direction, but expanding the concept of the European Health Union in all these other areas. Thanks a lot. And we'll be talking more about these specific policies of transition in our next panel, which we'll move to now. But I want to thank all four of our panelists on this first panel for some great contributions. And definitely there's a lot of food for thought there. Uh, to start off our next panel, I would like to introduce a pre-prepared video statement from Hans Kluge, who is Regional Director for Europe of the World Health Organization. Greetings from the WHO European Regional Office, and thank you for inviting me here today. Next month marks two years since the World Health Organization formally declared COVID-19 a pandemic. In this relatively brief time, the world has learned often painful lessons. Lessons which, if absorbed and acted upon, can benefit future generations over several lifetimes. COVID-19 has demonstrated all too clearly that for modern societies to be sustainable, we need health system resilience, underpinned by emergency preparedness, nurtured by cooperation. COVID-19 has also demonstrated that no single entity can address public health threats alone. We have two choices, either move rapidly towards solidarity and strategic cooperation or risk ever greater disaccord and disintegration of a cooperative world order. For WHO Europe, the choice is obvious. From its inception, the European project was about preventing conflict and bring about greater regional cohesion in the wake of World War II. The path towards prosperity was through unleashing economic potential via internal and common markets, lifting millions out of poverty and contributing to lasting peace. That in turn was seen as essential to better health for all. In the decades since, economic growth has proven a key determinant of good health. Good health, in turn, supports economic growth. Investing in health is one of the most crucial commitments governments can and must make. The pandemic has shown that in no uncertain terms. Indeed, even before the pandemic, health was regarded as a key priority in Europe, followed by the economy. Proof that citizens across the region, know full well the value of strong health systems. People demand, and rightfully so, that their health needs are met, that governments are accountable for investments in health systems, including emergency preparedness. 
Ultimately, as we have seen in the past two years, it is regional and global cooperation that can deliver that. Collaboration yields results, like rapid vaccine development and deployment, like the EU Digital COVID Certificate, two outcomes of innovation and partnership that inspire us to do more and aim higher. But we cannot be complacent. What threatens our ability to better prepare for future challenges is collective amnesia. When danger ceases, human nature often forgets lessons learned, and the price to pay is high. We must admit that Europe has in the past underperformed in readiness. It is our collective responsibility to change that. To strengthen readiness, we must strengthen health systems. In this, balance is key. Not focusing solely on the emergency at hand, but also planning for the long term. This means identifying gaps and addressing needs where strategy and funds are lacking. This will help design and implement policies, legislation and research in which multiple sectors communicate and work together. Fortunately, we have a roadmap to follow. The groundbreaking WHO European Program of Work 2020-2025, unanimously approved by Member States in 2020. The Program of Work recalibrates health priorities under key themes and pillars, offering governments and civil society a blueprint to collaborate on United Action for Health. Current European health reforms envisage greater regional cooperation. And these reforms, when implemented, will reverberate and benefit far beyond Europe's borders in our interconnected world. All I've said feeds strategically and logically into the model of a European health union, which to me is the region's most urgent development priority. A strong European health union can better support the European program of work. It will also help establish stronger mechanisms like the European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, taking the lessons of COVID-19 to heart in planning and preparing for what may lie ahead. WHO Europe has long been your close partner and will continue to work tirelessly to contribute to a healthy, prosperous region and beyond. On the upcoming two-year pandemic mark, let's reflect on and learn from the past as we plan for the future. Thank you. I think that message from Hans where he's saying that we really have to be less reactive and more proactive is really key here. And I think it's really key when we're talking about the lessons from the pandemic. And that's what we're going to be talking about in our next panel. How do we prepare for the long term and how do we get European health policy in fighting shape before the next pandemic hits? So let me introduce our panelists now. We have with us Christine Berling. Head of International and European Affairs at the Directorate General for Health at the French Ministry of Solidarity and Health. France, of course, currently holds the rotating presidency of the EU Council. We have Professor Ilona Kikbush, founding director of the Global Health Program at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. And we have Professor Martin McKee, Pro professor of European Public Health and medical director at the London School of Hygiene and tropical medicine. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Christine, let's go to you first. Um, what is the French presidency's vision when it comes to future EU health policy and how much has that vision been shaped by the pandemic we're all still living through? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, it's fine. Right. 
I suppose so. So um, thank you very much. Um, and most appreciative of this opportunity, actually, to express a French presidency vision. And you will see this is a lot of convergence with the previous panel, actually. Um, but before the vision, we, we need to, to speak about the mission because the presidency act in the frame with the legislative agenda to advance. So, um, so we will first, I mean, um, strive, I mean, to conclude the ongoing negotiation on the cross-border health stress regulation and really help put on track ERA, this new health emergency preparedness and Re response authority. And, and this is an important, I mean, a part of the, um, of the presidency, um, um, let's say, um, planning actually, uh, be because we need to strengthen this security package that was put on the table by the European Commission and, um, and, and, and I think it's very important that we were able both, I mean, to act collectively very quickly to respond to the COVID-19 emergency, but also that the Commission could be able to uh, take lessons and put this package, I mean, on the table. And of course, I mean, besides, I mean, strengthening this security package, the objective of the presidency is really to think beyond and to enlarge the public health scope of the union and, and just trying to build on the ambitions of this new health program that was put on the table as well. Um, this, is, this was the core of the informal EPSCO meeting that took place 10 days ago in Grenoble. And, and the, the questions asked, I mean, by the French health minister was, do we need to strengthen the European Union beyond the security package? And if so, what are the concrete areas for which European level would represent a clear added value? And, and actually the whole of the ministers, I mean, the, to this first question, they say yes. And it, it was a resounding yes. So there were no game of uh, uh, Brussels versus, I mean, member states uh, prerogative. It was yes. The COVID crisis has shown, I mean, and has illustrated that we need to go further for the better health of European citizen. And in particular, I mean, the ministers consider that both health in whole policy and the one health approach should be really and actively pursued to close the health divide across Europe. Um, and, and there were some areas just like rare disease, antimicrobial resistance, digital health, cancer control, mental health, just to mention a few that, that were further, I mean, discussed. Um, and, and the idea that um, um, the French presidency had would be maybe we should develop a public health pillar of the union based on the examples of the Euro European pillar of social rights. Um, this could really constitute a common compass for member states with measurable impact at hand. Um, so, so really, I mean, COVID crisis, um, we have proven that Europe stands on its value and we were able to activate all internal mechanism really to act swiftly. And we were also able, I mean, to cooperate on cross-border uh, to help each other when, when member states really were under pressures and they, the health systems were under pressure. So it was possible, jointly possible, to, 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 to state, I mean, that um, since Europe has shared the same currency, maybe now it's time to just to close the gap um, of, of health divide, I mean, uh, across Europe. So, um, to your questions, I hope I have understood that. Uh, but the vision is yes, we we can go. I mean, beyond the, the the purely security package that we've put on the table, and and really act to 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 work on it very concretely. Thanks. All very good points, Alona. Let's turn to you next. I mean, when we're talking about international cooperation and health. It isn't just the EU that struggles with this. Of course, it's, it's hard to coordinate uh, health policy between different countries. So how well are we doing currently on international cooperation on health? And what really needs to improve to get us to the outcomes that we want? 
Well, thank you, Dave. And uh, we can definitely say that the European Union was a much more proactive actor over the last two years in uh, the international arena and took a whole range of initiatives, but uh, you indicated it, they will need to be more organized, they will need to be more strategically aligned. And the other partners on the global level obviously need to be well prepared uh, what to expect from the European Union. I think a European health union clearly needs a global dimension that has been reinforced also by the French presidency. It was uh, very important uh, that uh, for the first time the health ministers met with the foreign ministers in Lyon actually making the point that health, that development policy and that foreign policy come together in a strategy that the European Union needs. And uh, they agreed that actually one of the things that needs to be done is to revise the existing 10-year-old uh, European health, uh, global health strategy and to turn it into a strategic framework and a strategic framework that obviously needs to reflect a number of things that have already been mentioned. On the one hand, that geopolitical dimension. On the other hand, uh, the fact that we need global cooperation to ensure the health of Europeans, meaning enlightened self-interest, that it needs uh, to show global uh, solidarity and global responsibility in relation to equity and that obviously the European values in terms of social values, the European Green Deal and others should also be reflected in its global action. I might highlight that how important this is was shown by uh, the European, uh, European Union, African Union summit that was just concluded. If you think back two years ago that health wasn't even on the agenda of this summit, even though many of us uh, had asked for that, and this time it was actually dominated by the health uh, discussion and also led to significant tensions uh, because of the issues around intellectual property, for example. So uh, I think there needs to be a good strategic thinking among European uh, member states in what way to take uh, global health forward, in what way to help produce uh, global goods for health, as was stated frequently, in what way globally we are willing to share research, to share data, to share innovation, and uh, build true partnerships and move away from the old donor-recipient uh, relationships. As far as the self-interest goes, uh, some of those issues were mentioned, but I'd like to highlight them. Health is now one of the biggest industries in the world. Data is one of the biggest industries in the world. The workforce is a challenge for the whole world. Uh, so it is very obvious that we need to work together with others on this, that we need to have a strategic position, uh, that we need to be value-based, and that we need to be agreed within uh, the European Union in what direction we want to go. One very last point, not to underestimate how much uh, action that Europe takes in quotes for itself has an influence globally. Uh, many uh, of the colleagues like to speak of the Brussels effect, that is norms and standards that are set within the European Union because it is such an important trading partner become relevant for the whole world. And I think we need to move in that direction. Uh, the protection of health data, for example, uh, is one such area where Europe can make a tremendous global difference. All those issues are on the agenda of the French presidency. Christine has already mentioned some of them. And if we're able to take that next step 
towards uh, revising the global health strategy, I think we will be moving forward in an excellent way and taking the many steps the European Union has already taken financially and politically uh, to a new level that is absolutely necessary and make the European Union a true global health leader that is credible also to low and middle income countries. Thank you. That's an excellent point about last week's EU-AU summit. As you mentioned, it wasn't on the original agenda before it was um, rescheduled. It wasn't on the agenda for the last summit in 2014. And yet, as journalists, health was the main topic that we were covering on Friday because, again, it was this uh, question about vaccine IP access and ramping up uh, vaccine production in Africa. It's amazing how quickly health became such a major topic in international fora. Martin, let's go to you next. We've talked a lot about how uh, an EU health union can work so far, but is a European health union really needed or are we really just talking about maybe national governments needing to improve their health performance? Yeah, well, um, a very good question. Thanks for asking me. And of course, it's rather difficult coming after all the other speakers, because I suppose in many ways, much of what I would have said has already been picked up. But I think it is. And one of the reasons, maybe I can turn it round and say, why would we not want a European health union? Now, it's a cliche, but this wasn't the first pandemic and it won't be the last one. And we know that the virus was able to take advantage of the economic and the political union within Europe. So why would we not want to put in place our ability to respond by having a health union that could mount a coordinated response? But even if you do believe that the case is obvious, as clearly I do, then obviously, then clearly not everybody is convinced. So we need to look a little bit more at the practical implications. And coming from a public health background, the first priority, one of the major priorities for me, is the need to coordinate much better our intelligence on the health threats that we're facing. Now, we still don't have consistent data systems across Europe for the exchange of data, despite everything that's been done in the GDPR and elsewhere to harmonize the data and to remove the barriers to the exchange of data. We don't have consistent definitions about what a COVID-related death is. We are lacking a lot of the information that we need to provide context. We do not collect data consistently on for example, socioeconomic status, and particularly we have a blind spot to the health of minority ethnic groups in many countries in Europe. So there's a huge amount more that we can do to be able to get a comprehensive picture of any pandemic, any future health threat. Second point, I think, is that we're far stronger together. Now, this is true whether we're talking about collaborative research in Horizon Europe, for example, or by getting our procurement right. Now, of course, if you're a big country, you can do it well. You don't need anybody else if you're Germany or, or France. It doesn't apply in the United Kingdom. It's a big country that didn't do it well, but let's put that aside for one minute. Um, but if you're a small country, then you really have a challenge when you're getting into either the research, the, the uh, analysis, or the procurement simply because of the problem with capacity. But it's not just that. Again, we can do more. We really need to ask ourselves why, even though there were some cross-border exchanges at the beginning of the pandemic, why it was that Italy ultimately had to depend on assistance from China. The third, which Alona has picked up very well, is that Europe must be a global player in all of this. Now, we saw what happened when Donald Trump was in the White House. Thankfully, given the current events to our east, he's not there at the minute. But we've no idea who's going to be there after 2024, not least because of the large scale efforts to undermine the electoral system. So in an increasingly uncertain world, um, the health threats are not just from pandemics, what we did in the Pan-European Commission, which Mario Monti has already mentioned, was to look at a very broad spectrum of health threats, uh, which include conflict as well as infectious disease. Then Europe needs to play a role there, not just on the continent of Europe, but internationally in issues like vaccine equity and all sorts of other things. 
But again, something that Vitenis has picked up is that this is what people want. This is what the citizens of Europe are asking for. Now, Europe needs to be more than a vague idea, more than sort of some concept of working together in some way. It actually needs to make a difference to people's lives in the areas that concern them. And health is one of the areas that concerns them more than any other at the pre at present time. And to me, at least, that is more than enough reason to have a European health union. Thanks, Martin. I think some, some good arguments for health union there. Uh, let me ask Christine, we, we talked a little bit about what the French presidency is, is looking at uh, in terms of what can the, what the balls that can start rolling now and then the ones that will take a bit longer. But of course, we know these things take time. The European Union itself took time to build and, and all of the different institutions. It takes many years. So what kind of time frame do you think we're talking about here when it comes to a true European health union? Are we talking a year, five years, 10 years, 30 years? What do you think? <laughs> I'm actually not counting time just like that because I've been involved I mean, in European affairs I mean, for many, many years. And what is very interesting is it's just a stepwise approach. It's not because, I mean, um, COVID-19 has accelerated this, the pace that we, we, we should, I mean, um, run too fast, actually. We, we need to build. And, and it's a constant endeavor that I started years ago. I mean, the, the public health I mean, union I started um, when Europe um, was the first, for example, to address I mean, tobacco control at the highest government level. It was in the 80s. It was um, at the time, I mean, François Mitterrand for France, Margaret Thatcher for, for Britain were head of state. And, um, and the, the, this, this health union was being built with a single market. It was to protect the citizen from global health threats. And this is, this is actually the very concept of global health, but we didn't phrase it like that, I mean, before. Um, so COVID-19 COVID has accelerated things um, and has concentrated the means. We, we have now a health, I mean, program that, um, that funds, I mean, all the collective joint action. And this program has now a budget of 5 billion, where we add only 400, 400 million or so. Um, so, so I think we, 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 we have also, I mean, on the table, this ambitious cancer control plan we have never had before. I mean, and, and so we have worked, I mean, collectively on cancer control. Uh, the, we have the farm to folk strategy, we have the Green Deal, we have a lot of pieces all together. And what the Minister says is maybe we need now to really implement health in all policies. And, and, and it, it should be the, the green line where we, we should work on, actively work on. Uh, but I, I just want to, to point out um, that, that um, it, we should not forget, because um, I heard, I mean, from the previous panel that uh, some criticism on member states playing with Europe against the Commission, etc. What, what we, we shouldn't forget is that ultimately, I mean, good health of the nationals are the responsibility of member states. So we, we really need to all coordinate at European level to advance better, I mean, on, uh, on citizen health and, and, and close this, I mean, health divide across member states. But the responsibility, if we want to build, I don't know, I mean, this union um, really closely interlinked, I mean, member states into a union for health, the responsibility will have to be shifted some, somehow. And, and this is tricky. Uh, Ilona, I want to put the, the same question to you about the time frame. And also, we talked a bit in the first panel about treaty change and whether or not that's needed. Uh, Christine just mentioned a lot of things that are already happening that obviously don't require treaty change, and many things can be done that don't require it. Uh, but of course, 
whether or not we have treaty change would affect the speed of where we're going, right? So do you think that uh, treaty change is necessary to have the changes that we want here in a short period of time? Dave, I'm of course speaking about the global health dimension and I don't think we need a treaty change uh, to push that forward. We had a global health strategy 10 years ago where, you know, there was much less talk about health responsibilities of the European Union than there is now. So I think, and if we look at uh, the statements and the actions uh, of various parts of the Commission, the Council, the Commission itself, and the Parliament, it's quite clear that uh, they would like to see a better, more structured global health cooperation. So in my view, uh, such a uh, framework, such a political framework for the EU's global health action could actually be produced quite quickly over the next two or three presidencies. It's also quite important because of the many other things going on in global health. I mean, it was the European Union, the president of the council that proposed uh, the world embark on a uh, global pandemic treaty. Uh, there are revisions of the World Trade Organization procedures that uh, need to be taken forward. So in many other areas of global uh, activities, the pandemic has led uh, to the push. We need to revisit things. And Europe needs a position. Europe needs to be able to act jointly. Europe needs to be able to act responsibly. And therefore, in my view, there is actually quite a strong need and pressure uh, to have a true uh, geopolitically oriented uh, global health strategy. And as I said, I think that could uh, be worked on uh, at a reasonable speed within uh, a year or two. Thank you. Thanks. Martin, same question to you. If, if treaty change is too complicated to be done and we, it, it's going to be ruled out, is the whole conversation pointless because we can't actually do it without treaty change? No, I'm not sure. I think you can do a great deal without treaty change. You already have an Article 168, the commitment to a high level of human health to being in all of the, the European Union's policies. And that will that certainly provides a, a mechanism. It provides a, a basis to go forward with many of the things. And if they can't be done by treaty, then it's likely that many of them could be done by intergovernmental action anyway. So I, I think that... Uh, Clearly, nobody really wants to unpack the treaties at the minute for all sorts of reasons. And um, because once you open up the, the negotiations on health, clearly there are so many other things that certain member states will want to deal with. So I would be inclined to do what we can and then find out if there are some things which absolutely do need the uh, a treaty change but i'm not immediately clear what they are given that it should be possible to do an awful lot with the measures that we already have so let me take some of the questions that have come in from the audience first off we have a, a comment that i want to read out this is from a mep istvan uhelyi from the european parliament uh, it says the idea of the european health union arrived from the european parliament I'm not sure if anyone disputes that, but uh, we have several new initiatives. In the SD group, for example, we are working to have a mental health program for the EU. The big question is what the member states are doing in the council. Please help to push them. It's not a sovereignty issue. Um, Christine, let me put that to you because I think that is kind of point, pointing at the council there. So do you, where's the block here? Uh, he seems to be saying the block is not coming from the European Parliament or the Commission. The block and actually having a real European Health Union is the Council. Do you agree? I, I, I don't know if he can agree. I mean, it's um, it's always tri trilogues actually. So uh, we all bring our pieces, and uh, we really appreciate. I mean, what the Parliament puts on the table, but sometimes the agenda are different because then for implementation uh, an active implementation in countries you need to organize this thing. So there's a lot of, I mean, reflection currently of how we can do, I mean, better and, and uh, more in terms of mental health. Um, 
and this is, um, and I, I would like to say, this is a pan-European endeavor, actually. And um, with um, Hans Kluge, we have a lot of I mean, discussions and there, there is this big planning, but we have to know exactly where to start, what to tackle. This is very plan. We have to put this concretely on the table and we will have, I mean, the funding and thanks to the European Parliament as well. I mean, the funding for the health program has been increased tremendously. So uh, we, we, I mean, we, we are complementary, but, uh, but, but always, I mean, when you wait, I mean, the other party takes too long, I mean, to, to, to move forward. So, um, so, so I don't know what to answer. I mean, I think the council makes its best, I mean, to, to stabilize, I mean, the process and to move forward. But, but sometimes, I mean, for us, even so, I mean, it takes too much time. Yes. So we've had an interesting question come in from the audience. Martin, I want to put this to you. So it's about non-communicable diseases, which are sometimes known as lifestyle diseases. So these are diseases that would come from behaviors. And the question is from Florence Bertoletti from Eurocare. In order to really prevent NCDs, what should be done to deal with the commercial determinants of health and commercial interests that are currently facilitated by internal market rules? So the question basically is, does the EU internal market itself allow for financial interests that are in turn hurting people's health uh, because they contribute to these kind of lifestyle diseases uh, like obesity, uh, tobacco, this type of stuff. Is there a contradiction there in any way? Well, there is in the way that the internal market works, of course, but it doesn't have to work in that way. By the way, thanks, Florence, for the question. And I would actually maybe take issue with some of the language that you've been using in terms of lifestyle and behavior, because essentially these are corporate diseases. They're caused by the corporations that are promoting unhealthy communities, the alcohol community, the alcohol industry, tobacco industry the junk food industry and others that have a more indirect effect like the gambling industry. And we need to recognize that these are industries that actually contribute net nothing because the, any economic benefits they bring are more than outweighed by the damage to health and to the economy through lost productivity and lost labor force participation and the lost value of life that goes with that. So I think we can recast that. And I think that we do have the mechanisms in place, both in the treaty and that a high level of human health in Article 168, but also in case law, like the Cassis de Dijon case and others about proportionality. And we just need to reframe the arguments better than we have done before. So I think more can be done I think one of the challenges is for us in the public health community to, to develop our arguments to make it clear that these uh, industries are themselves the threat and are every much as th a threat as mosquitoes are as vectors of infectious disease, for example. And we need to challenge the narrative that they have been so successful in putting forward that they are part of the solution. Now, we're seeing I think a move away from working with some of these industries as they try to promote themselves as having a shared interest in health somewhere or other and recognizing that uh, we have that with the tobacco industry. I think we've still got a long way to go with the alcohol and junk food industries. But I think that we can do it within the provisions that we have. But we in the public health community need to be much more robust, much more strong about challenging the narrative that they have developed. And we also need to be particularly vigilant as they seek to control the uh, regulatory system, both the technical regulations. And of course, we, we see this in international relations. The EU has been good on this, looking at investor courts rather than the much less transparent uh, investor state dispute settlement processes that are favored by, for example, the UK or the United States. So I think the EU needs to stick to that because then you can get the health element much more strongly into those discussions. But um, Florence, absolutely right. We need to reframe these as diseases where the primary cause is are the groups, the, the companies that are producing using the products and not frame them as a lifestyle choice because they're, they're, they're really not. So the next question I think would be a good one for Ilona. Uh, this question comes from Thibaut Derwell from the University of Lausanne. 
Uh, thinking out of the box, could the EHU be achieved by a treaty outside the EU framework? An interesting question. Given that diseases aren't just in Europe, obviously the pandemic was global, should we instead be focusing on a more global framework rather than thinking about a European framework alone or a European framework outside the EU framework? Well, Dave, of course, that is already happening. Uh, the, uh, as I said earlier, the uh, European Union, the president of the council has proposed a global pandemic treaty. Uh, so that means uh, all countries, uh, at least all member states of the World Health Organization have embarked on the process to negotiate such a treaty to decide right now what the process should be, what the major priorities of it should be. So, of course, we have mechanisms to have global treaties, and many people forget that the World Health Organization uh, has the possibility to agree on global treaties, and the very first one was the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It also has the possibility for global regulations, and all European member states, of course, uh, are committed to implementing the international health regulations, which I might add they had not done, which is one of the reasons we had some of the pandemic problems that we had, aside from a lot of political uh, problems we had because of the wrong type of decisions. So I think there are different levels. There is the level of uh, what must the European Union agree to do jointly as a union and also as a union based on values, uh, which is trying to define its place in the world right now, a drastically changed world. And where is the European Union in its totality a partner or even an initiator of global agreements. And of course, many of us think that uh, these global agreements, these commitments to produce global public goods together and the willingness to reduce the unbelievably large health inequities around the world and vaccine inequities were just, you know, uh, an extreme uh, illustration of what is going on day by day by day. And uh, uh, geopolitically, a rich continent, a rich union like the European Union cannot uh, accept that such uh, gross inequalities exist. So yes, we need international cooperation and the European Union must be a key player in finding global agreements to move forward. I'm going to take one last question from the audience. This one will be for Christine. This one comes from Gaston Simon. Is it possible to imagine a special European fund for avoiding differences of health services between the different countries of the European Union? So something, I guess, like uh, cohesion funding, but specifically for health to get all the health outcomes level. Well, Actually, I think it's it's already there because we have um, uh, special funding to be able to uh, help I mean, the, the member states uh, for the COVID-19 and, um, and, and to implement, but not only COVID-19, just to leverage and implement um, what is being needed uh, following the, the semester conference. So we have already, I mean, funding boxes there's a lot of funding inside, which really meets the expectation of member states and the evaluation done uh, through the semester. And we have this social fund uh, also, uh, which really help, I mean, strengthening the, the health system. Uh, and we, we need to, to play and coordinate between the various funding, um, just to, to make sure that we, we we leverage and we, we've been able to, um, to to reach what we want to reach. I mean, in terms of um, our system for the citizens, but but it's um, it's a constant endeavor. I mean, um, national and European level both. I mean, are working together, and and then this co global coordination actually. So it's um, it's going on, going on, but it's um, it's um, it's very challenging.
we've seen prevention, for example, with the, the questions asked, I mean, before about um, what are we doing for, for NCDs? We've been doing a lot, but it's never, uh, you have to start and start again. I mean, bringing up the messages um, and, uh, and the prevention and trying to focus to specific groups uh, just to fight inequalities as well. So, yeah, I hope I have understood. At least I've tried. Thanks, Christine. So before we wrap up, because we're just about out of time, but I want to get the, the final thoughts from all of our panelists, but we're going to do it a little differently than we normally do it. I'm going to get a tweet from each of you. Uh, so we've already had two tweets uh, put out there that I can read to you now. Uh, so Maria has tweeted uh, to wrap up today's discussion. To respond to pandemics, citizens want more coordination, European capacity and convergence, and international solidarity. This is only possible with a real EHU. And Vitanis tweeted, the knowledge about untapped potential to save lives is the main reason to work together for a European health union. Josep, I think you're still connected. Josep, what would be your 40-word tweet-like summary, uh, the main thought you have from today's discussion? Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm struggling, as you say that, into two. One probably would be, and just pleasurizing for my colleagues today, uh, a central lesson of the pandemic as we build back better is that, I'm going beyond the words, there's a strong rationale for health in and health for all policies. And now beyond the rationale, we have the clear instruments, governance and financial instruments as put forward by the Monti Commission. The second, if I may have two tweets and my colleagues in the observatory from the observatory will tweet them in a minute. The second would be probably uh, not only viruses cross borders, we need a stronger European health union to tackle all these other challenges, health challenges. Thanks a lot. So, Martin, what would be your 40-word takeaway? Yeah, well, I've just tweeted it, in fact. Uh, so, hashtag stronger together. Um, a hashtag European health union is essentially prepara essential preparation for the next pandemic. Fantastic. Ilona, what would be your tweet, final tweet? Well, very straightforward. The European Union must be a strong global actor in health with the goal to reduce global health inequities and promote the values of universal health coverage. Fantastic. And finally, Christine, what would be your 40 word takeaway today? Well, I actually, I'm not a tweeter, so I mean, uh, I will make an effort, but, uh, but I would just say that we should be proud, I mean, of uh, Europe, that we, we stand uh, on our value of solidarity, and, and we should already be proud of this. I think that's a good closing statement. So thank you to all the panelists uh, that we've heard from today. I think we've had some really, really interesting interventions. And I think some of the key things we've heard here today is that the EU already does a lot in health, right? We know that the constant refrain we hear, it's a member state competence, but in reality, the EU has been doing a lot of coordinating and the pandemic has really thrust up this role. So we're, we have this interest from citizens, we can see it documented, and we can see here today, we have the interest from policymakers. The question is, how do we translate that into rea a reality and actually make the European Health Union happen? So there's definitely gonna be a lot to watch here, particularly as we come out of the pandemic, and maybe as the, the memory of the pandemic fades, the urgency behind this might start to uh, wither away. But I know all of you out there working in the health space won't allow that to happen and you'll be keeping this top of mind for both policymakers and citizens. So thanks so much again to all of our speakers. Thank you to you at home for spending your afternoon with us. And I wish you an excellent rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>